Well, I am so excited to be here with you in this moment. There's something powerful that happens when we come together, when we worship, when we pray, when we get into God's word. The Bible says we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. We're reminded in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews to not stop meeting together as is the habit of some people. We've seen the past two years, but not you. You're here. We're meeting together. We continue to encourage one another because the Bible says, as the day draws near, what day is that? The day where Jesus comes, he brings heaven down to earth and we're all together. What a moment that will be. So I'm proud of you. I love this moment with you. I thought we'd do something a little bit different this morning because last week's topic on Sodom and Gomorrah was a heavy topic. We learned about God's justice. We learned about the importance of our bodies, how they're a temple of the Holy Spirit, and we shouldn't defile those bodies. We learned about the only sexual relationship that God blesses is a man and woman in the covenant of relationship. It was a heavy topic, but I know that we've grown as a result. So I thought we'd start off a little bit lighter today, a little bit more uh, jubilant, maybe is that the word? And I wanted to provide you with some coaching on Christian pickup lines. Christian pickup lines for those of you who are married, maybe you can add this to your repertoire with your spouse on the next date night. For those of you who are single, I'm believing 2022, maybe this is a year you fall in love or fall in love all over again. So Christian pickup lines, why don't you check out the screen behind me? Hi, I'm Will. God's Will. <laughs> so bad. That's, this is a good class. It's a good class. Now I know why Solomon had 700 wives, because he never met you. <laughs> <laughs> so I was reading the book of Numbers, and I realized I don't have yours. You can call me Pharaoh, because I'm never going to let you go. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't believe in predestination until I met you just this moment. <laughs> I like my girls like I like my Microsoft Word documents. Say. <laughs> I don't normally have the gift of prophecy, but I could definitely see us together. <laughs> My parents are home. Want to come over? <laughs> that's, such a, that's such an underrated pickup line. Uh, Is your name Faith? Because you're the substance of things I've hoped for. <laughs> I'm alone and it ain't good. Man, you're better looking than all the animals in my garden. <laughs> what does that even mean? <laughs> Anybody ever tell you, hey, it was like a flock of goats? <laughs> See, I may not have a job right now, and I may be living in my parents' basement, and I don't have a lot of money to my name, but I am storing up treasures to heaven, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Red flag! <laughs> so the Egyptians were making me make bricks with no, hey, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Hey girl, hey girl, hey girl, hey girl, hey girl. The Bible said to think about what is pure and lovely. So I've been thinking about you all day. <laughs> girl, you milking honey, cause you look like the promises of God. <laughs> I know you've already said no to me six times, but I'm like Joshua, I'm about to break down the walls. <laughs> hey girl, is that a mirror in your Bible? Because I can see you reflecting Christ all day. <laughs> hey girl, are you related to Abraham's nephew by chance? Because I like you a lot. <laughs> girl, are you a guardian cherub in the book of Revelation? Because you've got eyes all over you. That was a good one. <laughs> You're like a rapture at the end of a long tribulation. Girl, are you the new Jerusalem? Because I swear I saw you descend from heaven. <laughs> Are you Temple Gates? Because you're called beautiful. Oh, okay. You and I are like fish and loaves, girl. It's a miracle when we're together. Come on, let's multiply. <laughs> <laughs> Do you love me? Feed my lambs. <laughs> what does that even mean? What does that even mean? <laughs> Those are two of our servant leaders, Apollo and Nathan, in the back. We put our hands together for Apollo and Nathan. 
they are both happily married to females, Destiny and Rebecca. They told me that those lines worked for their spouses to secure them. So they are tried, they are tested. I hope it brings you success in 2022 as well. Well, how many people know we can have fun and laugh in church? It's important. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And what's so interesting is that our Bible study today, it's the very first mention of the word laughter. Abraham and Sarah, they were waiting for the promised child. They couldn't believe it when Isaac finally came at 100 years old, Abraham and Sarah 90 years old, and Sarah couldn't help but laugh. We see laughter throughout this Genesis narrative from Abraham laughing, from Sarah laughing, from last week Sodom in Gomorrah. The people were laughing at Lot, believing that he was joking around. And Ishmael's laughing, mocking Isaac. And we see a variety of laughter taking place in the Bible. But when we see Isaac finally birth, this type of laughter is joy, unspeakable joy. So psychology and psychologists today continue to find the many benefits of laughter. I'm not sure if you are aware of this, but laughter, evidence reveals that being funny makes a person more attractive. So... For those of you single, just laugh a bit more. Maybe this will help you on your journey. Being funny, people are considered to be more social, more intelligent. Sessions of laughter can boost the immune system. It can relax muscles. It can aid circulation. It can protect against heart disease. And regard to mental health, laughter can lower anxiety, release tension, improve, move, and foster resilience. And would you agree with me in 2022, we need more laughter in our lives. I know for me, the people I enjoy spending the most time are the ones that make me laugh, the ones that lift my spirits. And I know that the same is for you as well. So let us turn to our Bibles, Genesis chapter 17. We're going to start at verse 15. This is Isaac. He is the birth promised. Let us listen to the word of the Lord. It says this, And God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she will become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed. And he said to himself, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No. But Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. And Isaac, his name means laughter, one who laughs or one who rejoices. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him. I will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father 12 princes. And I will make him into a great nation, but I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. The word of the Lord. Just a reminder, on a Sunday, we can't get to every single topic and aspect of our passage. That's why every Tuesday, we have a deep dive class where you can go live at Concord, you can Zoom, or you can catch the podcast following the service and get deeper in the word of God. We want you to grow in the Bible. You will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. A couple of things I do want us to focus on. Number one is this. We see many name changes throughout the Bible. Right here in the book of Genesis, we see Abram. His name is changed to Abraham. We see Sarai. Her name is changed to Sarah. We will see the great-great-grandson Jacob, whose name is changed to Israel. Later on in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, you see Moses changing the name of Hoshea to Jeshua or Joshua. And then we get to the New Testament with Jesus, where Jesus sees Simon and he changes his name to Peter and Cephas. This is extremely significant that God sees an individual and he changes their name. This is significant. Why? Because names in the Bible have deep meanings. It could determine someone's purpose. Names often signified a person's character. 
Like Genesis 27, 36, Esau said this about his brother Jacob. Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me these two times, first the birthright and now the blessing. Name changes most often given by God also establish, write this down, a new identity and purpose. God changes the name for a new identity and purpose. So with Jacob, God told him, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. God gave Jacob a new identity and purpose. He went from being a liar, a cheater, a manipulator, a swindler, to his name being changed to Israel, one who is a fighter of God, one who is triumphant with God, someone who has the attitude, I will not let you go until you bless me. This made me curious on my own name, so I looked it up. What does Raymond mean, and I found out that Raymond means wise counselor and protector. I was a little bit surprised. Was it predestined that I would have a background in clinical psychology? In regards to being a protector, I can't wait till my daughter start dating so I can intimidate those boys that come and protect <laughs> the family. Lord help me. My daughter is nine going on 15. And it made me a little bit sad for Nathan Kennedy. His last name means misshaped head. <laughs> you know, Nathan, I think he has a well-proportioned head, but think about in our passage today, he took Sarai and he changed her name to Sarah. He told Abraham, you're not going to call her Sarai, but Sarah. Listeners would have noticed the subtle differences between Sarai and Sarah, that he's moving her from a princess to a queen to royalty. This name change reveals Sarah's destiny. She was a barren wife. She was the old wife. She was the one whose the biological clock has stopped. She was the one who had drama with her maidservant and everyone was laughing at her. But God says, no, no, now you will be known for the womb that will bring forth nations and kings like King David and King Solomon and eventually Jesus, the king of kings. It makes me ask a question that we should consider today. When someone says your name, what comes to their mind? When someone says your name, what emotion does it elicit? Do you have a good name? Because Proverbs 22.1 says that a good name is better than riches. Favor is better than silver or gold. What is your name? What is it that you bring when you carry? And if you are unsure, I have good news for you. Just like he did with Sarai and with Abraham and Jacob, God wants to change your name. God still wants to change your name and he's still in the business of changing people's identity and people's perception. Maybe the last two years, your name has been fear. Maybe your name has been anxiety. Maybe it's been frustration or guilt or shame or sadness. Well, God can change your name, your identity, your purpose. He can pick you up and turn you around and set your feet on solid ground. He can change your name from dead to alive because God did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. And it is a reminder that he wants to make you a new creation. He doesn't want to just fix you, make you a better version of yourself. He wants you to be filled with the Holy Spirit, born again, walking with authority and power that everywhere you go, you make earth more like heaven and people more like Jesus. When Jesus taught us to pray, let his kingdom come, let his will be done on earth, you and I are called to be the image bearers today of heaven on earth. God can change our name. You and I need to take a look at the lies that we have told ourselves, or maybe some of the lies that have been spoken over your life, and you need to replace it with the truth. What is the truth? The truth is this, Revelations 2.17, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give him a white stone with a new name written on that stone. This is a major theme in the Bible, the changing of names, being an image bearer on earth, representing heaven. This is the good news of Abraham and Sarah. 
This is their story that through them, the entire world is going to be blessed. Write this statement down that Abraham's family is a new humanity through whom God will bring blessing to the world. This was God's original intention in the garden. This is God's intention with Abraham and Sarah. This is God's intention when Jesus arrives to earth. And guess what? This is God's intention right here, right now, that through Abraham's family, a new humanity through whom God will bring blessing to the entire world. Think about the echoes we are hearing from the Garden of Eden. Are any bells ringing? Are you having flashbacks of things we have talked about in Genesis, in the Garden of Eden? What did God say to Adam and Eve? He said that I will bless you. What is he saying to Abraham and Sarah? He said, I will bless you. Whoever blesses you, I will bless. Whoever curses you, I will curse. I will make your name great. What does he tell to Adam and Eve? He says to be fruitful and multiply. What are the echoes to Abraham and Sarah that I will give you descendants? This keeps rubbing, excuse me. I'm not going to swing it around. Come on now, (laughs) Pentecostal. I will give you descendants as numerous as the stars and the sand. Be fruitful and multiply, echoing now with Abraham and Sarah. He told Adam that all of creation will be blessed with you. He told Abraham and Sarah, all of creation will be blessed with you. He said that kings and great nations are going to come through you, a seed that will crush the head of a serpent. And now kings are going to come through you, Sarah. Do you see the echoes? This is God's original attention, and he still wants this to take place today. The invitation to be blessed and join God's family through faith is still available today. Think about this, Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia. The Jewish Christians are having some disputes. They're wrestling, they're fighting. They are straying away from the gospel. They're saying that we are saved by adherence to the law of Moses. And Paul says, do you remember Father Abraham that he believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness? And now you think that through your works and adherence to the law that you can be righteous? No, no, no. It is through faith. And the reminder is for us today that through faith, you and I can participate in the seed of Abraham. He says this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Write that down. Those of faith. And the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, he preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. I want you to know today that that invitation is still available for you today. Anyone who believes in their heart and confesses with their mouth will be saved. It's not what you did, it's what he has done done already, and you and I can be participants of that relationship with Jesus Christ. Let us continue on our Bible study. I love this next part because it shows the humanity of our, uh, of our Abraham and Sarah in the Bible. What do I mean by that? Well, we sometimes lift them up on a pedestal like, there's no way I can be like this. But remember that Abraham and Sarah are a mixture of dirt and divinity just like you and me. He tells Abraham, this time next year, you're going to have a child. And what is his response? He laughs. The father of our faith, father Abraham. And now he's laughing. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God said, No, Sarah this time next year. That's a little hard to comprehend. If it was in my circumstances, 100 years old, my wife is 90 years old, her biological clock has stopped. How is this possible? And I wondered, why did God take so long for this thing to take place? Well, I know that it's not uncommon for people in our culture to have children later on in life. I thought about a couple of celebrities who today had children that maybe seem more senior. Have you uh, know the person on the screen right here? Salma Hayek, do you know that she had a baby when she was 41 years old? What about Gwen Stefani? Yeah, 44 years old when she had a baby. Halle Berry was 47 years old 
when she had a baby, Halle Berry, Halle Berry, 47 years old. And then did you know that Janet Jackson, 50 years old, when she had her first baby? What about the men? Those are some of the ladies. What about the men? Well, did you know that Rod Stewart, right, 66 years old, had a child? Steve Martin, 67 years old, had a child? Richard Gere, 69 years old, have a child? And then here's the one, Mike Jagger, for the eighth time, (laughs) 73 years old, his eighth child, no wonder he had the moves like Jagger must have been <laughs> true. His eighth kid, 73 years old. And I wonder if Abraham and Sarah would have had kids 73, 50. Well, that's not impossible. But I believe that God waited all this time because he wanted to know beyond a shadow of doubt that human interventions do not bring about divine promises. Let me say that one more time. Our human efforts, our human intentions, our work, our hands do not bring about miracles. Only God brings about miracles. And then he asked this question, what I want to ask us today. Is anything impossible for God? And the answer is no, nothing is impossible, that he can take a womb that has been barren, whose biological clock has stopped, and he can breathe life into that womb. Jesus can do anything. He can make rivers in the desert. He can bring manna from heaven. He can part the seas. He can open up the eyes of the blind. He can make the lame walk. He can make the mute speak. He can heal our disease, and he can forgive our sins. He is the God of the impossible. He can do all things. This is what this story is trying to let us know. Regardless of doubts, regardless of frustrations, even though they laughed, even though they pleaded with God, no, do it this way. Nothing will stop what God intends to do. Nothing will stop it. He is the God of the impossible. Author John Walton provides the following insight. It it has taken 25 years for Abraham to receive the complete information. Think about this. First, God was going to make a great nation of him in chapter 12. Then, God was going to clarify that this heir was going to be a biological son in chapter 15. Now, in chapter 17, he's letting him know that the heir is going to be Sarah, Isn't this how God works in you and my life? He doesn't give us the full picture. I bet you for my more senior people, 70 and 80, if God told you everything you would have went through from the very beginning, it might have scared you. It might have freaked you out and said, no way, I don't believe that. Yeah, that's not how God operates. He gives you little by little. That's why he says, give me today my daily bread, that he is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path that he's trying to teach us, just like back then today, that he will provide all our needs. He's Jehovah Jireh. That's why the Israelites in the wilderness, when the manna fell, he said, take just what you need for this day. And if there was any excess, it turned to rotten, and the worms and the maggots ate it. Why? Because God wants us to know that he is our provider. He is our sustainer. He will take care of you. He sees you. He loves you. You're the apple of his eye. I, that he wants what is best for you. Do you believe that today he is your provider and nothing is impossible for God? A major theme in the Bible. But I love how the Bible is showing us humanity. Because if we're honest, I bet you there's been times where we've doubted, where we laughed, where we said, God, this looks impossible. How are you going to come through? I don't believe it. This looks like the end of the road. God, this seems impossible. And how many times something happened to us and we might have laughed. We might have doubted. Look at Abraham's response. He laughs. He said, shall I bear a child? And Sarah, she says the same thing. Now that I am old and my Lord is worn out, am I going to experience pleasure? Yet none of the doubts, none of the frustrations thwart what God is going to to do. And then Abraham gives an interesting response. He says this, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Catch this. God is trying 
Abraham is trying to correct God. He's in, this, in a sense saying that, no, no, I know better, or this is my thought, or why don't we take the way that I'm trying to make happen? And what is God's response? He says, no. It's a question that I need to ask myself, and then you need to ask yourself, are you okay with God telling you no? Because sometimes that's the response. Are you okay with not getting your way? Are you okay with Jesus being first in your life and guiding your steps? I wonder, why did Abraham say, let Ishmael live before you? Here's one thought. For 13 years, Abraham has lived his life with the belief that Ishmael is the promised son of God, that this is the covenant is going to be carried through Ishmael. All of his love, all of his hope, all of his dreams are set on this boy. He's not waiting for Sarah to have his child. That ship has passed. As far as he's concerned, he's believing that Ishmael is the one who's going to live before him. And God says, no, I know this is a story about Abraham and Sarah, but I can't help but see you and I in this story. How many of us have set our trust on something other than God? How many of us are dead set on this happening the way I want and when I want? And we haven't even considered that God is leading you to something new, that God is leading you to a different season that God is leading you to something that you haven't perceived because maybe you're wrestling against the no. Is it possible today that there's frustrations because he's leading you this way and you're saying, oh, let Ishmael be the one. I love the song that we sing that says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Another central theme we see in our passage today is there is doubt and the persistence of God. You can write that down. Doubt and the persistence of God. How does our Bible study unfold? How does this end? There's been some promises. There's been some laughter. There's been some doubt. Sarah laughed. God said, why did your wife laugh? She said, I didn't laugh. No, but you did laugh. But you know what? This time next year, it's still going to happen. And you know what's so powerful about that statement? Abraham's speaking to himself. Sarah is speaking to herself, yet God hears the thoughts and the hearts and the intentions. That should be a good reminder for us that we can come to God and just be honest. We don't have to pretend We don't have to speak Christianese. I'm too blessed to be stressed. I'm too anointed to be disappointed. We can just come to God and say, God, I'm upset right now. God, if you don't come through, I'm going to whop someone in the head. God, you can just bear your life and say, God, I'm laughing. I, I don't believe it. It's impossible. And I want you to hear that your doubt does not stop the persistence of God. How does our Bible study end? Genesis 21, 1 through 7, it says this. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said. Underline that. And the Lord did to Sarah as he has promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of a son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, when he was eight days old, as God has commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children, yet I have borne him a son in his old age. I want us to know this in the first two verses, there's three comments that the author points our attention to. What is it that he's pointing? He's stressing the fact that the Lord is faithful to his word. As he has said, as he has promised, as he has spoken. It's a good reminder to us that God is not a God that he should lie. If he says it, he will do it. It's a good reminder from us that all of God's promises are yes and amen. 
It's a promise that God is faithful to his word and he is careful attention to the details of our life. Our laughs don't stop it. Our disbeliefs don't stop. Our frustrations, our fear, nothing will stop what God has determined to do. This is a theme all throughout the Bible. People doubt, yet God is persistent. People lack faith, yet God is persistent. Think about when the Israelites were pulled out of slavery into the wilderness. You know what they said? They must be out of their mind. They said, remember when we were in Egypt and we were eating meat by the pot and how amazing it was. What about when you were crying out to God to rescue and were getting whipped at the hand of Pharaoh? Yet their doubt didn't stop the persistence of God. Think about the father who was before Jesus and his son was demon-possessed. And the demon would throw the son sometimes to the fire, sometimes to the water. And Jesus said, through faith, all things are possible. And the father shouted out, I do believe, help my disbelief. His doubt did not stop the promises of God. And think about Thomas, the disciple who said, I will not believe that Jesus rose unless I put my fingers in his hands, unless I touch his side. And Jesus shows up and says, here I am, Thomas. Put your hands here. Put your fingers here. You believe because you see, well, blessed are those who believe and have not seen. That's you and I today. We are blessed because we believe that he is the son of God, that he is coming back, that he will do everything that he said he will do. He is a man of his word. He will come through. He is the God of the impossible. No matter your circumstances, no matter your situation right now, God has a plan for you, and God will see it through to the very end. Can you put your hands together, church family? As the worship team comes forward, I want to read you this quote from Charles Spurgeon. Very beautiful quote that is so relevant for you and I today. He says this, God has given no pledge that he will not redeem and encourage no hope that he will not fulfill. I want to say that one more time. Let it sink deep in your hearts and to your mind. It says this, God has given no pledge that he will not redeem and encourage no hope that he will not fulfill. What are the precious promises that God is giving to you and I today? There are hundreds and hundreds of promises. I don't have time to read every single promise. Let me give you a couple of promises to remind you as we wrap up today's teaching. Promise number one, God loves you deeply. God loves you deeply. Romans 8, 38 through 39 says, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, height or depth, anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If you're wondering today, am I loved? Does God love me? The answer is yes. His promise to you is that God deeply loves you. Another promise God gives you is that he is giving you wisdom. If you're wondering, what do I do next in my life? What is God asking of me? I'm confused. I'm lost. Things seem dark. I feel like I'm at the end of my road. The Bible promises you this, that if anyone lacks wisdom, you can ask God and he will give generous, liberal wisdom. Today, if you need an answer, if you're stuck, if you're confused, you can pray to God and he will give you wisdom. Another promise that God gives us is that he's come to give us life. A lot of fear and anxiety, what's going on these last two years, but God says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you may have life in life abundantly. This is his promise to you today. By his stripes, we are healed, we shall live and not die. And to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Jesus came so that we may have life. That's a promise. God promised to always be with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is with you always, even to the end of the age. He's a father to the fatherless. He will never leave you. And another promise to think about that he is our provider. He is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He will take care of you. If he knows the lilies of the field and dresses them up in beautiful array, if he knows the sparrows that fall, 
how much more will he provide for you? He is your provider. He sees you. He hears you. And he will act. With every head bowed and eye closed, I just want to give an opportunity at the end of every service. If you have not started a relationship with Jesus Christ, and you're saying, today is the day. I want to be part of the family that's blessed. I want to be part of the family of God. I want to receive what it is that you're offering today. Well, what I'm offering is what the Bible offers. Anyone who believes in their heart and confesses with their mouth will be saved. If you want to receive Jesus and start a relationship today, will you raise your hand? I just want to agree with you. Today is the day you're saying, yes, I want to start a relationship. And the second thing I want to ask is this. Many people's joy meter is low. Some people can't even remember the last time they laughed where it hurt so bad it brought tears. Some people right now may feel empty, scared, and feel that their mental health is disturbed. I've been praying for this moment that as we spoke about laughter and God came through on his promise that he will come through right here, right now, and you can be filled again because the Bible promises this, in his presence there is fullness of joy. As we sing Jaira one more time, I want to invite you if you would like to stand, if you would like to lift up your hands, if you would like to come forward and I will lay my hand on you, I'm believing that the Holy Spirit is going to move and you will be filled once again with confidence, with hope, knowing this, nothing is impossible for God. Let us press in for a few more moments, church. Oh, I'm already loved. I'm already chosen. I know who I am because I know what you spoke. every hand lifted towards heaven. Father, you hear the voice of our cry. We need you. We are desperate for you. We cannot do this thing, life, apart from you. So, Father, I pray that you would forgive our sins, 
that you would give us clean hands and pure hearts, that you would fill us again with the joy of our salvation. We pray, cast us not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit. Restore unto us the joy of our salvation and renew an obedient spirit, a willing spirit, a spirit that won't be set on our own plans, our own wishes, our own desires, but we will say yes to the will of our Father. Wherever you go, we will go. Wherever you lead, we will lead because it's not our will, but your will be done. You're the God of the impossible. And Holy Spirit, I pray, touch every single person from the top of their head down to the bottom of their feet. I pray for miracles. I pray for healings. I pray that you would do what you want to do in this moment and remind us that frustrations are not final, mistakes are not fatal, and delays are not denials. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we all shouted, amen, amen. Put your hands together, church family, for the word of the Lord. God is good. All the time and all the time, God is good. I want to invite you next Sunday. We have our growth track. This is how you can become a member at the Bay Church. You'll know more about God. You can take your next best step. And don't run off. We have some donuts and coffee. Get to meet, meet someone, hug someone, and uh, share God's love. I want to let you know that the best is yet to come. Walk in victory. I'll see you next week.